how bad the alcoholism issues are up here. Seasonal blues. And and they are really <laughs> strong up here if oh, you don't boy. know how to handle them. Oh, okay. And uh, um, so a lot of them will be in their villages and then they end up getting kicked out oh, for various boy. reasons, oh. usually you know, alcohol related issues. Right. And they end up in Anchorage or they'll end up in, in jail for something and they get brought to Anchorage for that. And then when they get out they have nowhere to go. Mm. And they can't go back to their villages. Mm-hmm. And so then they end up on the streets here. Mm. And there's a lot of opportunities. Um they're working on it. It's it's an issue everywhere obviously. But there are shelters, and they do have some com- a lot of good community programs. It's just them knowing about it and um, accessibility and having the desire to follow the necessary rules to stay in a shelter. Was there ever a uh, psychiatric, a state psychiatric hospital here from which these people came from? I don't believe so. Okay. I've not heard anything about there being... So it's not the mentally ill being the homeless? Well... It is, oh, okay. um, because they're the most likely to not be able to hold down a job, yeah. and there's not nearly enough mental health assistance up here. Mm. The reason I guess is because I work in uh, such facilities for many yeah. years, and we've seen that how mm-hmm. this deinstitutionalization led to uh, homelessness yeah. among these people because they closed all these big centers, yeah. and these uh, people didn't have to go anywhere. Right, and that just and, and then it just progresses. And gets worse and worse and worse. Oh boy! And and in a lot of cases becomes generational. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's alcoholism is a disease, and it's probably found more here uh, and than any other state. It is. It, we have a huge That's issue with it. We have a huge suicide rate up here. We have more per capita um, gun-related deaths. Oh no! Than uh, any other state, but seventy percent of those. I did not. And that's all related to alcohol. Seventy percent of them are suicide. Oh boy! Whereas in the rest of the country, it's around like thirty percent are suicide-related gun deaths. Oh my! But <laughs> with the uh, you, you have so many beautiful benefits to a place like Alaska, but then there's you know the dark underbelly mm. of a place like this, where. It's dark for so long. There's so much open space. On average, 500 people disappear without a trace every year in Alaska. Mm. To like, an entire yeah. planes, like biplanes, yeah. with multiple passengers, the whole thing that just gone. Nobody can find hide or hair of entire planes. Is that right? Yeah, and that happens a lot up here. There's uh, some speculation that it has to do with, because of how far north we are, the polar magnetism affecting um, GPS and compasses and things like that. Mm. And it can kind of scramble and put people off course. And so if a plane goes off course, they don't even know where to look for them. Yeah, that's right. Especially when you have 700,000 square miles of space up here. It's, (laughs) Alaska is enormous. I see a lot of small planes here. So yeah, is it, it is. Some of them are those. Uh, what do you, what do you call them? Uh, uh, the ones that land on the water. So we have both. We have biplanes um, that are you know the small ones for on land, but we also have uh, float planes. Okay. And they're um, we actually Lake Hood is the largest float plane airport I believe in the world, mm. and we have more pilots per capita. It's something like one in fifty three Alaskans has their pilot's Pilot. license. Oh, okay. The flyingest state, and we just pass back there. With so all the, the small reason planes. they fly so much is because there are uh, what easier to get to another that, location. And there's, and there's a lot of places where you can't. There's no roads. Oh, you can't because they don't we have, have very access, limited, road access. Yeah, so we have much. a very limited road system. Uh, I can't remember what the mileage on the like how many miles of road we have, but for a state as large as it is, yeah. we don't have nearly enough because we literally. There's nine total highways in the entire state. Right. Highway one, which takes you to um, out into the out to the Alcan, into Canada. Um, and when you go south, you have highway. It splits to highway three and nine. 
certain amount of time where they can actually utilize anything to get out there. Right. And the train only runs from Seward to Fairbanks. Oh. There's about 400 miles of track for the entire... So one track. Yeah, it's north, one track. North-south, or is it? it there's just yeah. one. Okay. There's... Um, In all of Alaska. There's sightings, yeah. Oh, okay. There's sightings so that when you have one going south and one going north, right. they can pull off let the oh. other train pass and then oh, get back okay. on the track. Um, and then there's a couple of uh, spurs off of the main line. One will take you to Whittier, one takes you to Polar. Oh. Um, and I think there's the, there's one up in... Uh, but that's not Amtrak, that's Alaska Railroad. No, that's Alaska Railroad and it is a state-owned railroad. Uh, I think it's the last um, state-owned and not like privately owned like the NSF. Oh, no. That's 
too much. <laughs> it gets pretty cold. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, I've lived in Michigan and we never had below uh, minus 10. Yeah. Ever. And we thought that it was the, the worst and, that we could get. And that's terrible cold. We were no. about minus 60. You, for, you adjust. And no, normally in Anchorage, you don't get more than like a handful of days that are that cold. Yeah. It'll stay below freezing. But it's not, you, you adjust very easily. Right. And you can stay inside and you can layer up. Yeah. And see, whereas when you live in a place that's hot, you can only take off so much clothes before you go to jail. <laughs> right. But you can put on as many layers and stay warm, even in the coldest of temperatures. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I enjoy. So the, most of the tourists come here during summer though. Usually, so, but yes. there are uh, those who come in the winter and they come here just to experience the cold or is it because of the, they have a lot of ski areas and other winter sports and things like that? So uh, most of our winter tourism is uh, for the Northern Lights. Okay. And, uh, and things like dog mushing which you can do in the summertime, but it doesn't have quite the same draw ah, as right. mushing in the snow. And ah. then in uh, in February and March, there's the Iditarod. So that draws a lot of tourism. And that's the, uh, in commemoration of um, when they had to run from Anchorage to, uh, to Nome to del with dog sleds to deliver medicine. Oh, or um, okay. there was a, I believe, a tuberculosis okay. epidemic that was happening. Mm. And I uh, can't remember the name of the owner, but Balto was the dog. So are these special kinds of dogs or just anybody, any, any dog can be trained to do it? Most dogs can be trained. You typically want to have a, a dog that's going to be strong. Um, yeah, really strong, but also equipped to be in the cold. Which That's is why right. they use things like huskies and malamutes huskies, that have yes. a thick fur right. so that they don't get so cold. I have seen uh, dogs um, that aren't as as thick coated, yeah. but most of the time they do try to have something that has more, you know, a thicker coat. Mm. But you can, you can train just about any dog. Oh. And so yeah, the Iditarod is, uh, that's one of the big draws in the winter time. The ceremonial start is in Anchorage, and then the official start is in Willow, which is about an hour and a half north of Anchorage. And uh, they do, I believe it's uh, 1,049 miles with their dog sled teams. So let's say if uh, people are coming to Alaska, what are the top three places you would recommend that tourists go to? Well, you always, you have to come to Anchorage. Right. Um, you know, there's other places you can fly in, but Anchorage is the only city, so it's the best bouncing off point. Okay. And it's kind of more centrally located. Right. Compared to other Fairbanks. spots. Fairbanks is very, it's, it's a nice place to visit, yeah. but it wouldn't be on the top of my list. Okay, unless good. you really want to see, um, like, Chena Hot Springs is yeah. up in that area. Yeah. Fairbanks, honestly, as even though it's colder, is more of a winter destination um, oh, okay. because it's further north, so you get better views of the northern lights. Um, you have the hot springs. Uh, there's lots of there's a lot of winter uh, tourist activity up there. Oh, okay. um, but in the summertime, Anchorage is a great hopping off point. Seward is a, a must see. Yeah. And if you can make it to Homer. Homer is absolutely That's beautiful. somewhere in between here and Seward? No, Homer, so when you go south from Anchorage, right. uh, about halfway through the, down the Kenai Peninsula, yeah, okay. uh, the highway yeah. splits, yeah, okay. and one way takes you to Seward, and the other way takes you to Homer. Oh, okay. And it's, uh, it takes about four hours on a good day to get down to Homer, um, and it takes about two and a half-ish to get to 
wise, yeah. they're, you know, 50 miles from each other, or I'm not exactly sure what the number is, but you know, they're, they're only this far away. Yeah. You have to go all the way up and then back down to get to it. Right. And there's a couple of places in Alaska like that because we have, uh, the Cook Inlet comes in to Anchorage and splits into the Kinnick Arm and the Turnigan Arm. We're okay. headed towards the Kinnick Arm side of things today. And the, both of the arms are so full of glacial silt oh, okay. that it's completely, that you can't build a bridge across it. You could, oh. you could cut travel time <clears throat> down from those places by an hour and a half right. to get to those, to the points directly across because they're only a couple miles from okay. one point to the other. But because there's it, there's over 900 feet of glacial silt deep. Mm. It would cost way too much in order to um, to try to build a bridge oh. because you'd have to be able to go down a thousand feet into the bedrock, oh. and it's just not worth the cost. And the other thing that causes so much issue with being able to build a bridge is uh, the tidal fluctuations. Mm. So the turning an arm specifically, because the Knick arm uh, spreads out a little bit differently, but yeah. the turning an arm has the second high, highest tidal fluctuations in North America. Oh. Uh, you get up to 39 feet in tidal fluctuations mm. from low tide to high tide, and that's not every day. But um, because of the way it uh, narrows in in the arm, you we get what's called the bore tide. And it, instead of it coming in like the like waves like you see in Hawaii that are these big beautiful surfable waves, right. you get a wall of water that can be up to ten I feet saw high. That. Yeah, on video it was so yeah. pretty. And it can move up to about fifteen miles an hour. Oh my and people will go out and surf that, yeah. but you're not having to catch a wave. Yeah. You can you get at, get in at the right time, and right. you can just ride that wave. I've heard people of people riding that wave up to seven miles. Into the into the arm because it's it, it just goes and it's so quick. Just like boats, I see the planes parked mm -hmm. here. There's of people, several so. um, there's several communities yeah. that the um, one of the requirements for right. living in that community is that you own a plane oh, is that because right? they have runways oh. in behind you know behind they'll have a line of houses and everyone's cars or planes will be parked next to the runway. Right. Unbelievable. It's a... Uh, never heard about this anymore. It's a different place. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, do people, when they come here, they go see the uh, glaciers, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Glaciers are a huge draw. Um, you, there, and there's so many. So the Chugach Mountains that are sitting to the, are right here. Yeah. Uh, they are one of the snowiest places in the entire world. Gets up to, on average, they get about 600 inches a year of snow. And uh, last year, we have one ski resort down in Girdwood. Um, south, you'll pass that area on your way to Whittier tomorrow. Mm. Um, but they reported about 700 inches of snow last year. Wow. And their ski season ended up uh, getting pushed into almost the end of May. So Girdwood is famous for the glaciers. So Girdwood is most famous for the ski resort. Oh, the ski resort. That's one of the big draws for Girdwood. Yeah. Um, and then Whittier and Portage area is really is well known for their glaciers. They call it Glacier oh, okay. Valley. Oh, okay. Because um, as you drive in there, it's just glacier, glacier, glacier. And yeah. when you go across into Whittier, like right as you're you'll go through the Anton Anderson Memorial Tunnel. Yeah. It's like a two and a half mile tunnel <clears throat> that goes right through the mountain. Okay. And um, right before you go in there, if it's not too cloudy, mm. the mountains are just covered. There's just glaciers everywhere. Oh. And then you come out on the other side and there's just waterfalls down the mountains oh. all over the place. Oh. It's absolutely make a movie of that as well. Yeah, we are going to love that. Yeah. It's so, so is the rail, uh, you were talking about rail earlier. Yeah. And you started working with the rail system. Mm -hmm. So uh, is 
Is it popular here in Alaska or people try to take their own car because this road is pretty good? They're not so, uh, a very uh, comprehensive road infrastructure in Alaska as far as I know. Yeah. So, uh, and the rail system also you were just talking about is like basically north-south and there's only one mm -hmm. one rail that goes uh, up and down. Yeah. So, if people, they come here, they take the rails or they prefer mm -hmm. taking the cars? You get both. Um, okay. And it kind of depends on, you know, Holland America, they get, uh, it's a lot of their cruise passengers yeah. that will take the train. Um, but one of the benefits to the train is you're going slightly, you know, most of the way it runs pretty close to the road. Right. But you're a little further away from the road. And the train is actually surprisingly much quieter than you would think. Okay. And so you have really good opportunities for wildlife viewing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just a slightly more scenic route. It goes a little slower. There's more time for pictures. Um, Holland America still has uh, decks that you can go outside right. while you're on the train. And that's a huge draw. And it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. Are you just trying to get from destination to destination quickly? Are you trying to stop at all of the locations along the way? Yeah, or are you trying to have like one good comprehensive, you know, slow roll to see things, yeah. but you might not be able to stop as often as you'd like? So there is a provision you could stop at different stations and maybe take it to stay there overnight and then take mm -hmm. a train the next day or something but yeah what do you see when you take a train let's say you're going to, from here to Seward and then um, if you don't want to stop anywhere do you basically see uh, basically like, let's say the, the, the waters as well as the waterfalls the mountains do you see any wildlife maybe bear okay yeah. that's only when you get lucky yeah it depends on how the wildlife's feeling is it do you <laughs> see more bear here or most um I would say I see moose more often. Oh, okay. Um, and it, it does depend on where you are. Yeah. Uh, like, on the way down to Homer, we were coming back from Homer last week, and I saw a dozen moose oh. in the matter of 20 miles. Oh, okay. And But I didn't see a single bear that trip. So I hear that they're more of a loner. They don't, like, travel mm -hmm. in, like, groups. No, they really... It's very <laughs> rare that you'll see more than... Uh, you'll, you might see them, like a couple scattered in a field oh, occasionally okay. but for the most part if you ever see moose together it's probably a mother and baby oh yeah, okay. yeah. and they usually never have more than two babies at, at a time oh, and they, they also... usually stay with their young for i think it's two years and so it's mostly they... but they don't hibernate like bears do no no so how do they survive the cold um, well, their their fur is very thick. Oh, they're okay. they're very physically prepared, oh, and okay. they have they, their legs are very very long, mm. and so you know they have the clearance to be able to walk in three feet of snow without it touching oh, their bellies, oh, and they're huge. <laughs> <laughs> the back of a moose could be six feet high. Whoa. They're enormous animals. So is it legal to uh, to kill them here? Only during hunting season. Oh, hunting season. Yeah. Um, moose season is usually, I believe it's around September, October. Okay. Um, before so, the food gets so too sparse. So I imagine that you would not have deers here. Are you no. Okay, we, don't no have, we don't have deer up here. Um, reindeer maybe? We do have caribou, reindeer. Oh, okay. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Um, Though they reindeer are actually not indigenous to Alaska. Oh, okay. They were brought over um, a couple of different years ago. I can't remember exactly when. But uh, they were looking for a sustainable food source right. for all of the miners and, um, you know, just all of the people that were moving up here for the natural resources. Yeah. There, there was just no sustainable source that was cold hardy and so they started they got someone from um, somewhere in the Scandinavian countries that's to, right that's what I was gonna say yeah, yeah. to come over they brought yeah. the reindeer over yeah. and had somebody come up and teach them about farming them and uh, how to you know grow a herd and then it got it's gotten to the point where they were so successful
successful that now they are part of the, the natural habitat. You mostly see them further north. You won't ever see them oh, in the wild okay. down in Anchorage oh, in this okay. area because they really do thrive in colder temperatures. Oh, um, okay. So um, the only places that you'll see them down here are yeah. the Wildlife Rest uh, Conservation Center um, where they're also working on farming and building herds and whatnot. And then uh, our, our famous reindeer, the Star the Reindeer, and uh, she lives downtown. Oh, okay. Uh, she's been there for, I want to say it's been like 30 years or so. Oh, okay. Uh, they grandfathered her in once the municipality stopped allowing for um, farm animals to be in uh, the municipal limits. Right. But she's lived there for so long that uh, she was grandfathered in and has her little cage with her toys and whatnot. Uh, if we have time, we can take you by to see her. Tell me about the spruce trees. I, they seem to be, and these are not spruce. I saw some of them here. Yeah. But so, this is a different kind of tree. But they seem to be much shorter than what we have in Seattle. Very much because of uh, the discontinuous permafrost. So because we get so cold here, yeah. only, not all of the, um, the ground doesn't completely thaw. Ah, Underneath us, okay, you okay, have, okay. Um, you a, you'll have a couple of feet. Yeah. Where it will thaw out in the summertime, okay. but it doesn't thaw all the way down. Mm. So, because um, 80% of Alaska is covered in discontinuous permafrost. So the top layer still freezes in the winter, but those first couple feet will thaw out in the summertime. Mm. And we're going to go to Okluna. You probably lose cell phone signal at some point out here. Oh, okay. And are these Are these like Indian names? Uh, yeah, they're native, native. Uh, Athabascan. Yeah, um, okay. Most, mostly Athabascan. The Denina Athabascan are mostly what um, we have in this area. Uh, originally, there were there was a tribe of um, Alutic natives that were down. Um, the first that they have estimates of about four to five thousand years ago, um, yeah. down near the Beluga Point area, headed south of town. And so then, just for the viewers to clarify that they don't, we don't call them Indians anymore because <laughs> they used to. Because it's like a, it's it's not like a bad word, but it's like they say that well, we're the natives actually, not right. the Indians. There right. was an they're Indian not, here. They're not from India. Yeah, they're not from <laughs> India. So actually, what the mistake that was made by was uh, by Christopher Columbus calling these people the natives Indians because he it was his mistake. He thought he was in India. It was not India. It was America. <laughs> and so all that and kind so of thing that we have been taught in school is actually of years. right. For hundreds of years, we've been referring to them as something else. Yeah. <laughs> oh, pretty. It might be a little cloudy, but this is such a—it's such a beautiful drive. And so, Aklutna Lake is where Anchorage gets ninety percent of its water supply, okay. and Aklutna Lake is fed by Aklutna Glacier. We won't be able to see this glacier today. But the, the lake itself is just absolutely beautiful. Mm. But our tap water in Anchorage is, uh, is glacier water. Oh, okay. It's, you know, it's been treated and filtered and whatnot. Okay, that, that was what I was going to ask you. So we, the best tap water you'll ever They could drink have. it. Oh, so, so much. I can't drink other water anymore. Oh. Because even though it's been filtered oh, and, and whatnot, yeah. it's better than most bottled water. Probably because tastes better it, as well. It tastes Very so refreshing. much better. It's so refreshing. And because of all the discontinuous permafrost, yeah. the pipes stay pretty cold. And so you let the cold water run for a minute, and you're going to have like ice cold water almost coming out of your tap. And it is the best. I was down in Washington last month and I went to fill my water bottle up from the tap. I took one sip and had to dump it out. It was terrible. <laughs> it was like, how do you guys drink this? This how is do you awful. Drink it? How do, it's awful. You have to have a water filter there. Not up here though. Up here, so, it's just fresh. yeah. So, uh, Britain, you you're yeah. born here in Alaska, or no? I'm a, I'm actually originally from Southern California. Oh, okay. Um, so coming here, didn't decide to go back to California. Basically, <laughs> well, and so before I before I moved here, I lived in uh, North Dakota. Oh, okay, so. Okay. I had my I had my fill of cold. Yeah, uh, from the cold is very cold. Being there, the coldest I ever experienced was negative forty-seven. Oh my goodness! Uh, 
but it's also there's nothing pretty up there. It's just uh, flat. Just there's flat. no trees. Oh, there, you don't right. have anything like this. I you know, you have a couple of hills. There's no mountains. Yeah. Yeah. There's no forests. It's mm. it's flat, barren wasteland. And so I figured if I was going to live in a place that the was cold, those are not as popular for the tourists. No. Oh. No, nobody wants to go to North Dakota. People mm. forget North Dakota even exists until somebody they know has been there. <laughs> or they have to check that off as their 50th state. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I had experienced the cold, and I was like, well, if I'm going to live in a place that's cold, I might, let, might as well stay in one that's cold and beautiful. Cold and beautiful, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I came up here, uh, 2019 was my first year up here. I just I instantly fell in love with it. Mm. I fell in love with everything that I've ever learned about it. Um, and after working in the restaurant industry for 15 years, right. and um, the, my, the last couple having people all the time, they're like, what is there to do for a few hours? You know, what should I go see? I don't have a rental car. My, my plane leaves this evening and I'm just trying to fill some time. Yeah, so you're custom made. And, and I was like, well, why don't I solve yeah. that problem? Okay, that's excellent. And and I absolutely love it. Having the opportunity to showing people Alaska is my favorite thing to do. Yeah. And excellent. building a business out of that is uh, is the, the best thing that I have ever I done. I saw the reviews are pretty good for yeah. you, so I said, well, I've got. Don't to have a lot of them yet, but I have really good ones. <laughs> so you got a good one from me. Excellent. <laughs> I I've you know this is my first summer. I just started at the end of April, beginning of May. Yeah. And it's been a slow start, but it's been a it's been a wonderful start. Mm. And I've met some beautiful people and I just you know, I'm I'm growing a base of people who the next time they're in Alaska I I've given people reason they didn't think they wanted to come back to Alaska and I've given people reasons to uh, want to come back. And I yeah. love being able to share something that I love so much with other people. Mm. And you know, it's it's not just a place. It's not just trees. It's not just mountains. It's the way that the the clouds uh, change the entire view, or oh, the way that right. the, the sun hits. It doesn't matter if I'm looking at the same thing every day. It's different every day. Oh, and I can nice I can way to put it. I can make the same drive every single day, and it never gets old because the sun is hitting the mountain differently. Oh, and okay. or you know the foliage has grown in differently. The fireweed is at a different so stage. Do they have a fall season here? It's short, but we do. Yeah. Um, and the leaves change the color. So the the fun thing here is that we mostly it's mostly evergreen. Um, and uh, birch trees. Oh. We get alder. Uh, we have alder and willow and um, a couple others, but they all just turn yellow. Their mm. leaves all turn yellow. Okay. You don't get like the oranges and the reds like you see, uh, you know, like in Boston or something like that yeah. in the Northeast. Yeah. You don't get those vibrant colors on the trees. You get them in the underbrush. Oh. So the fireweed, these pink flowers that you see through here, yeah. in the fall. There, so the fireweed is our summer calendar. Okay. In early June, it'll start to bloom at the base of mm. the of the stalk, and right. then it'll work its way as the season goes, blooming up towards the top. Mm. And once it gets to the top, usually about September, it seeds and lets off um, this this puff of cotton. And so we it, we jokingly call it like the summer snow because oh. it just covers everything. Yeah. And then. Once that puff of cotton is let off, we say they they say that there's about six weeks until we'll get our first snow oh, of the season, okay. and then right after then, in that time frame, all of the leaves turn yeah. these beautiful red and orange, mm. and so all of this underbrush here is all going to be red and orange. Red and, and so you have your red and orange on the bottom, you have your yellow and green through the trees between the right. birch and the evergreens, and then bright blue skies, and it oh, it's nice. short, but it is such a beautiful time of year. Yeah. And it's usually like the last week of August into the into s end of September, usually by end of September most of the um, most of the leaves have fallen off the trees and it's starting to get colder. Mm. Um, and 
pretty much always by the end of October we have snow. So except for the evergreen, most of the leaves are gone basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then it provides an entirely different level of beauty. Oh, definitely. Because oh, in the winter, you can see eagles' nests because there's oh. not foliage to hide them. Interesting. And uh, we have in the winter, uh, it's called the hoarfrost that will come yeah. through. And it's this thick ice fog and you can watch it roll in from ice the water. Fog. Oh. And it comes through and it would be so thick, you can't see 50 feet in front of you. Oh boy. And it deposits this thick layer of frost over everything. Oh my. Where you can't see through a chain link fence. Yeah. There will be so much frost built up in between those little squares mm. that you can't see through a fence. And it just makes everything look magical. I just wonder then how such little birds like, you know, or even eagles survive such kind of cold. So the eagles, eagles can survive up here. They don't leave in the winter. Okay. Um, pretty much all, most of the other birds do oh, migrate. Okay. Uh, we have about 10 million birds that migrate to Alaska every year. Mm. There's a variety one, of species. Mm -hmm, huge variety of species. Oh, okay. Um, the Arctic Tern is, uh, the one people come up here to try to see this bird bird watchers Arctic are term. are obsessed with trying to see this bird oh. it has the longest migration pattern of any bird oh, it does okay. 11,000 miles it goes from Alaska to the southern tip of South America every year oh my god and so basically you know it'll be up here for a couple months but then it has to turn right around and, and go they back they don't stop in the middle somewhere and they probably I mean they sure probably they, do, they yeah. pause but yeah. um, their destination for 11, migration miles. is 11,000 miles hmm. yeah good grief <laughs> I couldn't imagine Hard to believe Granted, at three years old, I discovered I couldn't fly, and I've been disappointed ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped Amazing. off a roof, <laughs> flapping my arms, trying to fly, and, yeah. you know, <laughs> didn't work out Goodness well gracious. Yeah. We'll stop here at this video and see what ever comes next. Yeah. And we'll take it from there. I'm sure the legs are pretty gorgeous. So how is the job situation for people? Uh, probably pretty, pretty low because uh, there's the economy as well as we don't have job creation here. There's plenty of jobs to be had. Oh. We have, the, the only reason people are unemployed is because they want to be oh, at, okay. up here. Okay. We have jobs <laughs> and most of them pay pretty decently because um, the entire cost of living up here is, is higher. Right. Um, so, but the minimum wage is still the same as you have in the other states? Uh, minimum wage up here is 10.34 an hour. Okay. okay. So it's a little higher than the federal 7.25, which is weirdly still not changed in yeah. 15 years. Yeah. Um, but uh, most, it's not, not a lot of places are only going to pay you minimum wage. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, we have, we have such a lack of resources and that includes human resources yeah that's very true so we can't you know when you're in Washington you know if you're in Seattle you can you can probably talk somebody to move from Spokane right. or from Portland because you need people here we don't have you anything don't to have, draw from that's right 40 percent of the population is already in Anchorage right. and you know the next the next closest thing is is Washington my, my partner is up oh. here because they needed uh, they needed summer help and so they had her come up from a sister company in Washington to work for the summer and then she loved it and stayed. But we we don't have that those resources. So we have mm. we do a lot of um, like the foreign exchange programs to get uh, workers up here in the summertime during tourist season. But uh, what about like getting people from Vancouver and all that? Because that's a different country, it doesn't work that way. Well we Canada? You, you can. But that they have to apply have for work visas, and it's it's a different ball game. Yeah. Um, like you have uh, J one visas, 
where they come up. Um, we get a lot of those from uh, from like Thailand and Jamaica, oh, okay. and um, Jamaica is a little easier because it's a protectorate of the U.S. So it's a lot easier for people to come up here and work. Is that right? I know um, that. Okay. And then yeah, we get Thailand. Mostly Thailand is what I see up here. Mm. Um, a couple so other, the visa of, you're talking about, the work visa they mm -hmm. get, and it's good for like a certain number of years? It's is, usually only good for a couple of months. Oh, okay. And, and so with the J-1 mark visas, it's college students usually. Right. And during their summer, they can elect to work. It's usually like three, four, six, or 12 months, depending on um, what kind of study that they're, what, what they're studying okay. in university. Yeah. Um, and most of them, a lot of them will come up for just like three or four months in the summertime. Hmm. And then they can go back and finish school. So you're talking about Thai, Thailand and mm -hmm. places South America, but I see that these Indians, <laughs> people from Asia is everywhere, including the Chinese. Yeah. I don't see them here as many in, in, oh. in uh, the battery in uh, Alaska. Is there any reason for that? They're not so attuned to the uh, cold uh, temperature you think I think that is a huge part of it yeah. um, we actually have a surprising number of uh, a surprisingly large Thai population up here oh, because okay. a lot of them come over on their work visa and then they fall in love and get married and stay here oh. so you'll find in almost every so you're saying they get married to Amer Americas mm -hmm. yeah oh, okay um, you'll find in almost like every small community mm. uh, throughout Alaska that you'll find some of the best Thai food. <laughs> oh, the best Thai food. I saw it at a couple we of restaurants. We have so downtown. many good Thai restaurants. There's, uh, there's a little Thai, uh, like a Thai food truck up in Denali. Oh, there's like, there's okay. hardly anything in Denali, but there's, there's a Thai truck and there's one in Soldatna. There's a couple in Soldatna. So because of the, um, the college student work visas. Is it true that at one point in time there were like uh, mostly men living here and yes. not so many women? And what yes. was the reason for that? Because women did not want to come here because of the cold? Well, or they so didn't have jobs or most families, of it, no schools? Um, schools were a huge issue um, because it was completely undeveloped other than yeah. native villages. And so there was fear for, you know, the safety and uh, women okay. don't come up to mine. That's yeah. what most of it was. It was a lot of gold mining. And oh, that's um, right. That's kind of what Alaska kind of took off because of gold mining. Oh. And then when they found oil in the North Slope, that's a male dominated field. It's not very often that women want to go work in fields like that. Oh. That's right. And hmm. so it just kind of started where you know it was mostly men up so here. we're talking about what about 60s 50s something like that so it became a state in 1959 okay um prior to that so captain cook came through came into he alaska went everywhere my god i've seen yeah. his name in new zealand yeah. and captain cook was a huge Australia. traveler yeah um which is why we have the Cook Inlet is named for Cook, for James oh, Cook. Oh, okay, there's a lake um, by, that, by his name. Yep, uh, the Captain Cook Hotel. Okay. There's a lot that's named for him. Even though he actually didn't spend a lot of time in Alaska. Yeah. He stopped at a lot of places, but he yes. didn't spend a lot of time. Ooh, that's interesting. I didn't know that any of these big guys came out here. This is a famous one, right? Mm-hmm. Right here. the Lake Chigak State Park. Coming into. This is a pretty long video, folks. <laughs> right me talking to me, this will go in many places, and all my friends and family and relatives will see it, and I highly recommend that you come to Alaska, and uh, uh, Brittany will be your personal guide and tour guide to take you places here. And even outside of factories, I believe. Yes. So, over for now. We'll make another video shortly. Bye-bye.